Hi, my name is Sandy Baird, and we're here with What's Happening to discuss the issues of, the t of today. Um, we are going to focus today on Russia, the former Soviet Union, and now Russia, where the United States appears to be once again uh, at war, perhaps in a proxy war against Russia. Uh, perhaps many people feel that it's a war to save Ukraine. Nevertheless, there are those who see this as an operation against Russia. So we're going to examine why that might be the case and what the attitudes have been and what they are increasingly with Russia. Um, and with me today is Kurt Maida, who is a scholar and a lawyer in our local community and who's joining us today to discuss, maybe argue, about uh, uh, the United States and Russian relationships. Before we do that, however, we'd like to show you a little tape, a, a video, of a speech that was done by John F. Kennedy in 1963, June 10th, 1963, in the middle of the Cold War, where he spoke at American University and asked the world, and asked particularly the United States, to consider the nature of the Cold War and the war against Russia, or the, um, the sort of imminent, almost, war against Russia, which ha has been historically accurate since at least the 19th century, um, to examine our, and he was exam asked us Americans to examine our attitudes about the, the then Soviet Union, and perhaps, um, perhaps think about making peace with that other superpower. Well, those attitudes have now changed back again, and we are right now considering a war for regime change, perhaps, in Russia. So we will show you this little excerpt from that speech from June 10th, 1963, and then have a discussion about that after that tape. Thank you. Some say that it is useless to speak of peace or world law or world disarmament and that it will be useless until the leaders of the Soviet Union adopt a more enlightened attitude. I hope they do. I believe we can help them do it. But I also believe that we must re-examine our own attitudes as individuals and as a nation, for our attitude is as essential as theirs. And every graduate of this school, every thoughtful citizen, who despairs of war and wishes to bring peace should begin by looking inward, by examining his own attitude towards the possibilities of peace, towards the Soviet Union, towards the course of the Cold War, and towards freedom and peace here at home. First, examine our attitude towards peace itself. Too many of us think it is impossible. Too many think it is unreal. But that is a dangerous, defeatist belief. And second, let us re-examine re our attitude towards the Soviet Union. No government or social system is so evil that its people must be considered as lacking in virtue. As Americans, we find communism profoundly repugnant as a negation of personal freedom and dignity. But we can still hail the Russian people for their many achievements in science and space, in economic and industrial growth, in culture, in acts of courage. Among the many traits the peoples of our two countries have in common, none is stronger than our mutual abhorrence of war. Almost unique among the major world powers, we have never been at war with each other. And no nation in the history of battle ever suffered more than the Soviet Union in the Second World War. At least 20 million lost their lives. Countless millions of homes and families were burned or sacked. A third of the nation's territory, including two-thirds of its industrial base, was turned into a wasteland, a loss equivalent to the destruction of this country east of Chicago. Today, should total war ever break out again, no matter how, our two countries will be the primary target. It is an ironic but accurate fact that the two strongest powers are the two in the most danger of devastation. All we have built, all we have worked for, would be destroyed in the first 24 hours. 
And even in the Cold War, which brings burdens and dangers to so many countries, including this nation's closest allies, our two countries bear the heaviest burdens. For we are both devoting massive sums of money to weapons that could be better devoted to combat ignorance, poverty, and disease. We are both caught up in a vicious and dangerous cycle with suspicion on one side breeding suspicion on the other and new weapons begetting counter weapons. In short, both the United States and its allies and the Soviet Union and its allies have a mutually deep interest in a just and genuine peace and in holding the arms race. Agreements to this end are in the interests of the Soviet Union as well as ours. And even the most hostile nations can be relied upon to accept and keep those treaty obligations and only those treaty obligations which are in their own interest. So let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet we all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures, and we are all mortal. Third, let us re-examine our attitude towards the Cold War, remembering we're not engaged in a debate, seeking to pile up debating points. We are not here distributing blame or pointing the finger of judgment. We must deal with the world as it is, and not as it might have been, had the history of the last 18 years been different. We must therefore persevere in the search for peace in the hope that constructive changes within the communist bloc might bring within reach solutions which now seem beyond us. We must conduct our affairs in such a way that it becomes in the communist interest to agree on a genuine peace. And above all, while defending our own vital interests, nuclear powers, must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either a humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. To adopt that kind of course in the nuclear age would be evidence only of the bankruptcy of our policy or of a collective death wish for the world. Okay, so Kurt, what do you think? And Kurt, again, this is Kurt Maeda, who is our scholar um, and citizen journalist, like the rest of us, um, and quite brilliant, I think. So, and we often differ, but anyway, so I'm going to ask him what he thinks about that tape so, and about our current attitudes about Russia. Yeah, I mean, uh, Sandy, thanks for having me again, and uh, thanks for everyone joining us today. Um, and joining the, us also is Eric Agnero. That's right. Right. So that's very important to note. Yep. Uh, so the speech, uh, it seems perhaps, you know, this was the third year, third, three and a half, third and a half year of uh, Kennedy's, yeah. you know, Kennedy in his administration. And uh, it seems like uh, something was happening behind the scenes that gave President Kennedy maybe, perhaps a wake up call. If you listen to the words that he used in the speech, uh, he provides some more specifics in his speech, the Pax Americana speech at American University at their uh, commencement ceremonies that year. But the sentiment is not very different from the famous speech that President Eisenhower gave mm, yes, right. when he left office, right. talking about the military industrial complex and then a speech he gave earlier, President Eisenhower, mm -hmm. called the Cross of Irons speech, mm -hmm. where he specifically talked about how much wealth in this country was going to be uh, contributed towards the development of B-2 bombers in exchange for schoolhouses. How many... Uh, Eisenhower. Eisenhower yeah, gave right, this speech, right, right. known as the Cross of Irons, he talked about 
the cost of aircraft carriers, the cost of ammunitions in exchange for the building of hospitals in needed areas right here in our country, in the United States. Uh, so he talked about the cost of war, the cost of preparation for war, and who knew, who knew more you know, than the supreme allied commander of the, uh, of the Western armies that invaded to fight Nazi Germany in Europe. He knew the cost of war. President Kennedy was also a veteran, but Eisenhower was a general yeah. during yeah. the Second World War. And he was there, you know, when our soldiers, as well as soldiers from Britain and Canada, invaded Normandy. He was on the ship, you know, seeing young men in that situation, you know, meet their, meet their maker on that beach in, in, in Normandy. So he took a, uh, took a brave mm -hmm. uh, stand. And it seems like uh, the 1963 speech that Kennedy gave at American University, he similarly has that sentiment, but not by talking about the actual physical costs of the expenditures for the preparation of war against the Soviet Union and against communism, but he talks about having a different attitude. Eisenhower. Kennedy. No, I'm Kennedy. Sorry. Right, sorry. Right, Fast right, forward. Right, right. No, because because uh, Eisenhower. Eisenhower was talking right. about the cost, exactly. the physical cost yes. of blood and money, right, uh, in being in this constant state right. of war, following the Second World War. And Kennedy talks about re-examining our attitudes towards the Russian people and the Soviet Union in hopefully, uh, pr you know, proceeding with peace uh, on Earth because those were the two adversaries of note at that time. Right, and I agree with, with you about Eisenhower. Do you have anything that you no, want I to mean, say? Uh, I think that the, the, that speech was followed by a treaty, right? With, uh, Who? With the, U, I mean, the U.S. and the, the, the Russians. With John uh, F. Kennedy, with yes. John F. Kennedy. John, not Eisenhower so much, but let me point out the historical difference. between, And I agree with you about Eisenhower. But you got to remember that Eisenhower spoke at a time when the Cold War was beginning. And I think it shocked him because he, the thing I found so moving about the Kennedy speech is that he remembered that we were allies with the Soviet Union throughout World War II. How many Americans remember that at this point? That we were allies, that we were together against the Nazis, and that the Soviet Union paid the highest price, as you know. Okay, Absolutely. let me go back to fifty to Eisenhower. Eisenhower was a, became aware of that industrial military complex during the time that we were allies with the Soviet Union. So of course he's not. The Cold War really hadn't reached its its head when Eisenhower gave that speech. Well, he, he gave, became. Well, 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 let me just. Yeah. You know gently correct he gave that speech in 1960 the day before he left office exactly he so became, the cold right. war was right was moving you know we hadn't invaded cuba mm -hmm. through the uh you know uh the bay of pigs right. that was a few months later right and that uh, was under but, kennedy but he, that right, was under kennedy right but the uh, cold war was was well well i in, know in but but isn't it a sign yeah, that finally a u.s president is not like powerful i mean i know that's powerful, the point i think forces behind him yeah and, yeah. Okay, the other point, though, that I want to make was that, and I commend Eisenhower. I, I think that he was really very prescient. Um, he came to, the CIA was established in 1947, correct? That's correct. So I right. think that the Cold War was really, I read a whole interesting article about President Truman. The same realization that the CIA became more and more powerful, and e and Eisenhower warned against it eventually, as did Truman. Well, the, the and as did the whole nature of that secret organization, and it's kind of behind the scenes doing things that were not approved of by the president. I think all three became aware that it was a disaster in the end. Yeah, I mean, you know, Eisenhower, you know, these were men that were Eisenhower, Truman, these were men were, that were born prior to the right. commencement of the 20th century. Exactly. They were yeah. born in the 1800s. Well, Eisenhower, and, yeah. Yeah, I think Truman too. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, they, their experience, and again, Eisenhower, in, you know, going through the, uh, the, the military uh, education that he had, 
Uh, their experience was following a war in the United States and most of the world. Uh, after a war, usually countries uh, dismantled. Right, exactly. We have, you know, that precedent even in, after fir the First World after War. After the First World War, right. Large ships, destroyers, the aircraft carriers of their, that time were literally physically dismantled exactly, at shipyards. Right. And they were used for scrap iron and for, you know, other industrial purposes outside of the context of war. That didn't happen after the Second War. Exactly, World War. exactly. The Department of exactly. War became the Department of Defense, right. oddly enough. Uh, and the state of being was that there was going to be a constant state of war, at least from a budgetary standpoint, uh -huh. at the very least, mm -hmm. if not the maintenance of soldiers and then maintenance of soldiers. In and, different and how about the draft? Yeah. What about it? I think that it was it, 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 certainly around Vietnam. It was it reinstated that. But after what well, you made an important point after World War One, the United States decommissioned. I mean, it went to Absolutely. and it went to a peacetime economy. But that was always the case. I know. After, you I know, agree. We were unfortunately involved in a lot of wars. I know. But after the war, there was a yeah. a peace honeymoon. So right. To speak, exactly. Exactly. You know, which didn't happen after the World War Two. That's my point. Today, That's my point. You know, fast yeah. forward to today, it looks like history repeats. We uh, the U.S. is uh, confronting the U. I mean, the Russians again. Yes, but we did that, as Kurt points out. We always did it. The leaders, I, my argument is that from the, the establishment of the CIA onward, that the leaders, the presidents, have not been in control of this kind of secret, permanent government. That's what Eisenhower was warning against. I think that's what Kennedy was saying, too. I don't think that the president of the United States in other words, has complete control over the CIA, and they do what they think is necessary. CIA, Department of Defense. Yes, right, you know, uh, and the National Security Council. Yeah. All of which was established in 47, and I right. think the presidents began to be aware of that and kind of warned, beginning, Truman too, Truman did too, began to, even though he was the one who initially bomb Japan with nuclear yeah. weapons. I think they all became aware that their power wasn't as absolute as they thought. And I think well, that I mean, the founding fathers never envisioned that the president was going to be an absolutist. Like, exactly. Ab so, exactly. But so. they were, it was going to have control. But the, but the initial presidents didn't have a secret government necessarily either. Well, I think either. what the realization of these men, Kennedy and Eisenhower notably, was that there was essentially almost a, a fourth branch of government yeah. that's not mentioned, that wasn't exactly. envisioned it's by, the, by the founding fathers or by, in the right. Constitution. I mean, the co what is happening today? I mean, like, we I have we, maybe... I don't think it ever ended. I don't think it ever ended Since either. Since then. In other words, and I, but I think all three presidents became aware of it, and that's why they cautioned, and that's why he's saying we have to have it. If you want permanent peace, you can't have these endless wars. You can't because they have a life of their own. And, and, and for instance, that's what Eisenhower was talking about, was the military-industrial complex. So do you really think that any, you know, if you talk about peace now in the Ukraine, it's almost censored. But I think it's also important, Sandy, uh, that we uh, apprise our viewers and, and acknowledge at the same time, though these were very important stances that you know, notably two of these yeah. men took, what was actually well, Truman happening... Truman did too, actually, in the end, yeah. But yeah. anyway, go ahead. But, what, 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 but, you know, Truman was also involved in the yeah. Korean War. No kidding, I after, know. After, you know, right. the Secretary of State initially, you know, gave the impression to the North Koreans and to Stalin that the United States would not have objected if Northern Korea took the Southern Peninsula mm -hmm. over, and then we changed our mind. And Stalin yeah. actually had a very difficult reaction because he wasn't expecting the United States to actually intervene in 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 Korea, in the Korean per Peninsula. No, I I totally agree with you right. about that. But you know, so, I mean, my my focus is on Eisenhower and Kennedy. So though these speeches and these stances were heroic stances at that time, they yeah. still would be, honestly. Yes. Uh, at the same time, you know, Eisenhower was involved in regime change. Mm -hmm you know, in Guatemala. Oh, terrible. Yeah. Uh, when there was a slight socialist tinge, 
that the pres the democratically elected president of Iran, you know, expressed mm -hmm. when he talked about uh, Mosaddegh. nationalization Mosaddegh. Mm -hmm. of yep. certain um, of certain industries, including oil, uh, and then President Kennedy in in Cuba, mm -hmm. in Guyana, in right. Vietnam, right. you know, sending lots of troops. I think it's and of course the you know really caustic conversations that he was having with uh, with with Berlin. When the when the East Germans put up the wall, mm -hmm. um, I I, I want to make sure that our viewers recognize that though these were heroic stances, these presidents were also engaged in you know saber rattling. I with agree. The USSR. I agree. But anyway, also I wanted you to comment during the Cold War what was happening in Africa. Oh, during the Cold yeah, War. This is Eric Anyero, who is from Ivory Coast. During the Cold War, they were like uh, those who were aligned to the Western powers, and those who were close to the to the to the uh, to Russia and, and the Soviet Union. And then, like uh, in the middle, there was also those who were uh, advocating for uh, uh, a non-alignment stand. But you know the war was as divided as it was today, maybe with less uh, uh, players, I should say, because it was uh, clearly the Russians against the Americans and the Western world. But today you have multiple, you know, uh, 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 um, poles of powers. China is a big one. Uh, you don't know if China and and Russia stands for the same ideals, but at least. They're against, <laughs> they have this a common enemy. And then you have also medium powers like India, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, Turkey and right. other powers that are over there, just at the uh, economic, you know, uh, stage. But politically, it's the same divide between the way, I mean, the same divide it, that we're seeing today is almost what was going on. It's the same thing. In other words, what my point about Africa. Um, and Latin America, where those countries during the Cold War were kind of going toward Russia. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the... They the, were going the, the, toward the, Russia, Cuba, for instance. The promises, right. look, I mean, these were, uh, unfortunately, you know, during this time of history, were very poor countries. Yes. And the Made model, so by the European white powers. Yeah, yeah. yeah no. Right. So that's why I'm saying yeah, yeah, yeah. during that yeah. time yeah. specifically, you know, historically, you know, the everything the world's always uh, ran on a cycle, you know, wealth and poverty. But the uh, the Russians, the Soviet Union provided a right. uh, a economic model right. that was right. more for people that were uh, poor. Than the capitalist model, exactly, which right. required a significant amount of capital uh, to get started, and uh, the collectivized farming and different kinds of programs that the USSR had were more palatable mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. Latin America and for Africa right. and for Asia mm -hmm. than you know than the model that uh, Western Europe and the United States had. Uh, because of the amount of poverty on the ground in those countries, so that was a a a very positive thing for many countries in Latin America and in Africa. Okay, so but my point is historically, the United States during the Cold War was really fighting against Russia. In certainly, okay. it was a chess match. Right, exactly, yeah. it was a chess match. Right. Yeah. Okay, why? Because Russia is kind of a competitor to the United States, also because. The white European powers have always wanted to conquer Russia in a lot of ways because of the in beginning with Napoleon, really, or maybe even before. So that's what I'm saying that these presidents, I think, while you while we agree that they continued that war, also kind of had a change of heart and realized, I think, how dangerous it was for the liberty of the United States, for the attitudes about peace. And that they weren't in full control. And for the, and for the economy of the United right. States. Right. But they weren't in full her. control. Yeah. Okay, my argument is if, if we look presently, the same thing is going on. It's war, in my yeah, mind, I would against, argue that it never stopped since okay, 1945. Okay, it never stopped. Okay, it never stopped. But that, and I agree. But that, that explains the war in Ukraine. Now, I want your, uh, to know what you guys think of that. What do you There's always been a state of belligerence, and you know it looks like the, the Western powers have always looked for an enemy. 
when it's not communism, it's like terrorism at a, a, a large scale. I mean, I don't know if it's just to justify, you know, uh, uh, um, having the military uh, complex at full, uh, you know, steam. use steam, or if it's a real enemy. Uh, are we uh, are we creating enemies? <laughs> I mean, I, th I think, look, I mean, if you look at world power dynamics uh, uh, among superpowers, superpowers like to have buffer zones mm -hmm. around them, geographic buffer zones yeah, around them. Exactly. You know, we I have mean, plenty. It, we have oceans. Right. We have oceans. Right. But even with, regardless of the oceans, you know, if you go back to President Monroe, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, we're going to go back to, you know, the early you know, 1800s, mm -hmm. this Monroe Doctrine you know, which is not on paper. This was just something that, you know, mm -hmm. the President Monroe at the time, uh, uh, you know, had published or talked about was that, you know, North America and South America are essentially ours. Yep. They are our regions right. and the Caribbean. Yeah. So uh, Cuba was part of our buffer zone. Right. So the fact that the Soviet Union uh, was talking about, you know, installing military installations. And 90, now China. Yeah, 90 miles yeah. off the coast of right. uh, Miami, of Florida, and then later, you know, uh, installing nuclear weapon facilities. That was unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And similarly, Russia does not want nuclear weapons in their Cuba, which is Ukraine, which is right on the border. Even though who's getting them now? Poland was, or, and Belarus too. Right, Belarus. Belarus is good. Right, right, right. There, yeah, but Poland also. But right? but my my yes, right. But Ukraine, my point yeah, was, yeah, you yeah. know that, yeah. you know, neither one of the two superpowers of the yeah. past want any kind of uh, vulnerability in the form of uh, militaries mm -hmm. or you know weapons of mass destruction on their borders. Why would you? Right. Right. Well, so we didn't want those in Cuba. The, the Russians don't want them in Ukraine. And exactly. Ukraine was showing interest in flirting with the West. They have not, been not, for a long time. Yeah, right, exactly. And we were engaged in the, the NATO and the United States, you know, part of the United States, part of, the, part of NATO, uh, were engaged in conducting war games uh, in Ukraine mm -hmm. just, you know, prior to the, uh, four months prior to the Russian invasion of mm -hmm. Ukraine. And that was something that was a poke in the eye for Russia. Right, exactly. They did not want, just like we didn't want nuclear weapons at our doorstep in, in, in Havana, in Cuba, the Russians don't, didn't want, don't want them right. uh, on their border. And that, okay, what? And that's, yeah. you know, that's my personal humble opinion as to what that war is about. Does it mean that, you know, uh, Cuba will be the next Ukraine? In, in, I think in the that American I think third. it's very dangerous what's going to happen in Cuba. Sure, I mean the Chinese. If for people that may not have seen the story in between all the uh, Trump indictment stories. Yes, yeah, right. Right. Uh, the um, the Chinese have struck a deal with the Cuban government. Yeah, apparently, to, right. Yeah, it, it appears. You know, Wall Street Journal reported it last week mm -hmm. that uh, they will the Chinese will be installing eavesdropping and spying. Uh, equipment facilities in Cuba, largely to, of course, spy and but not on Cuba. Yeah, not on Cuba to listen in on uh, conversations and activities that are taking place I'm in so, the United it States. It seems so incredibly blatant that the Chinese are doing this, right? I mean, yeah. aren't they inviting disaster for themselves or not? No. Well, everything or we disaster. buy is from China, so they, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the, yeah. the Russians did not figure out that you know if you sell cheap junk to uh, the West that they would have bought it mm -hmm. back in the uh, you know early 20th, mm -hmm. middle of the 20th century. Yeah, and I think uh, Ukraine set a precedent. So they, if the U.S. can go like a few miles from Russia. To you know, put like weapon of mass destruction and, and I mean at least armies. wage a war. Yeah, yeah. Then then maybe you know they won't say anything. We go to if uh, <laughs> China, yes. Russia, China goes to uh, to Cuba, Cuba. And, and the Cubans are desperate. Uh, yeah. yeah, they're you know strapped for cash. So Way the fact strapped. that strapped. So the fact that the Chinese are offering, they're saying billions, that's what the alleged report is. Billions? Billions, billions with a B. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, I, I think it was an offer that the Cubans couldn't refuse. Uh, Boy. Yeah, especially when, you know, they, they opened their arms to the U.S. Mm -hmm. and then boom, you know. Yeah, uh, so. They, 
we saw hotels that were built, you know, hoping that, you know, in the, the, the uh, you know, footstep of uh, Obama, you know, there will be uh, more, de uh, more economic, tourism, yeah, tourism yeah. And, and maybe. Just more commercial yeah, transactions yeah. and but interactions. It, it didn't happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen. So yeah. uh, it didn't happen despite the fact that, you know, you had one Republican administration that came in and then a Democratic administration in which the vice president is the, uh, of, you know, under Obama is the current president and there's been no opening. None. So it no, appears it's gotten that, worse. So it appears that China's thrown a lifeline out mm -hmm. at Cuba and Cuba grabbed it yeah. in the ocean. Yeah. Ugh. So. Well, it's dangerous times. But again, uh, I think uh, it's important to m remember that our relations from with Cuba stems from the Cold War. Absolutely. That that we blockaded Cuba yeah. against trade with the world, against getting credit because we saw we, not me, the president, um, saw that Cuba was allying itself with Russia. It Certainly. was. It's the same enemy all the time. It's always in the end Russia. Which um, the reason I want to talk that about this is that that is a view that is very unpopular. If you begin to talk about reality, that this war, and Biden has said so, that this war is really about regime change in Russia. Yeah. It's not about really about Ukraine, but Ukraine will pay the highest price. No, no, I mean, the co cooperation with, you know, the former Soviet Union and Russia, it just simply has not It's not never, happened. it never happened. Never happened. I mean, okay. you know, s simple blatant example was, you know, we had the awful, awful, uh, uh, bombing at the Boston Marathon yes. uh, th by, by, uh, two, by, by two, you know, individuals who were originally from Chechnya. Mm -hmm. And at that time, Russia actually had their eyes on these two young men yes, right, living right. outside of Boston. And they offered uh, intelligence to the FBI, the U United States FBI, about these two kind of suspicious, shady characters living you know outside of boston and who were you know still engaged in conversations and chatter with extremist chechnyan you right, know right which are groups. extreme against russia also right, right right and uh the united states at the time the fbi said not interested well the united states has always supported chechnya right against russia right right so the you know so these two young men then you know later you know right. out of frustration whatever issues they had personally decided to uh you know bomb the marathon right in boston right and they could have been apprehended or at least oh, been you right. know uh at least tracked and monitored and right, and the Eric, price of constant animosity. Right. Right, but the animosity always yeah. seems to me to be against Russia in the end. A lot of it. I mean, of course, we don't have a, the same kind of animus. It does not exist really with China. It's mostly still Russia. Well, the plan it appears is to, you know, has always been to essentially take over that Russia. country so that it could never be a threat, like they did with Germany. Yeah. And like they did with Japan. Yeah. Right. 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 It's always that would be the path to peace, having military bases in Russia, probably yeah, U.S. military bases. OK, so I think that we will stop today to not to talk more about this. What we think, what I think anyway, is a, a proxy war against Russia because it is a very uh, controversial view, I would guess. And we might very well talk about it again sometime later when this war does nothing but continue, I think, right? Yeah. Doesn't seem to have any let up between the, the proxy war against Russia, but the Chinese are taking advantage of, you know, yeah, of course. people and being <laughs> diverted, having their attention diverted to, you know, push the, the, yeah. the you know. Well, so. in the end, it's going to mean an alliance, yeah. a pretty firm alliance, too, with Russia and China. It appears it's going back yeah. in that. So yeah, the, right. the Sino Soviet so split it's because to, is being mended. Yeah, it's being mended. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much, and see you in a month or so. Uh, we, yeah, month, right. Thank you.